In this video I want to talk a little bit about Hispanic theater and what that term means and conclude with the discussion of John Jesserin's 1985 play Whitewater. It's a, a play by a Hispanic writer uh, who is an innovator in using um, technology in theater uh, to comment on the relation between reality and um, theater. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> let me discuss some of the um, features of Hispanic theater uh, that have occurred in the decades since the 1960s. At that time, historical pressures had urged our society in the United States and the theater culture within it uh, to accommodate more diverse voices within it. And Hispanic voices became quite prominent from the 1960s onwards. I want to begin by mentioning Luis Valdez. Uh, he was a student here at San Jose State University in the early 1960s. And indeed, his first play uh, was um, produced here at, uh, in the theater department here. Oh, I guess around 1964, 63, 64, uh, even though he was actually an English major. But in the mid-1960s and through the end of the 60s into the 70s, he became famous worldwide for um, developing a, a, a unique form of political theater involved with the farm workers movement in California. Uh, at that time in the late 60s, the farm, farm workers engaged in a um, huge struggle with the farm owners in California to uh, achieve union status or to develop a union, uh, which eventually they succeeded in doing. Uh, they formed the United Farm Workers Union under their leader, Cesar Chavez. Uh, but Luis Valdez was important in the struggle to unionize the farm workers, nearly all of whom were Chicanos, migrants from Mexico or uh, families that uh, were descendants of migrants from Mexico and had spent their lives working in the fields throughout California, fields and the great workers, uh, avocado harvesters, lettuce harvesters, apricots, all kinds of food uh, got harvested um, almost entirely by uh, Chicano farm workers. Valdez developed a unique kind of theater uh, to mobilize the farm workers and develop solidarity with the union movement. He put productions on the backs of trucks. The trucks drove in convoys out to the fields throughout California and put on plays, sketches from the lives, or familiar to the lives of, of Chicano farm workers. And the theatrical activity was integrated with the political activism. So they're going to the theater and participating in the kind of fiesta-like atmosphere in which the farm work, in which the farm workers theater right. um, also involved uh, uh, political activism and assigning people roles to perform in um, getting more Chicanos to support the union movement and to take participate in demonstrations and, and strikes and labor actions that um, uh, further the cause of the union and the improvement of the working and living conditions of farm workers. So on the backs of these trucks, uh, Valdez and uh, his team put on these sketches showing life that was familiar to the farm workers. 
oh, conflicts between uh, members of the family about the fate of the children and whether children should abandon the family to seek better lives or stay with the family and help the parents uh, as they got older or, or assist the uh, parents in, in um, uh, doing all kinds of chores or tasks and work that needed to be done in order for the family to uh, stay afloat. Uh, fights between uh, Chicanos in the bars and cantinas after work, uh, switchblade stuff and, and uh, stories about uh, oh, the lowriders, uh, um, young men driving around in these souped up cars or encounters with the highway patrol, local sheriffs and uh, unfortunate encounters with uh, shopkeepers and business persons with whom the Chicanos did business or owed money uh, in the various towns in which they worked, and romantic stories. Uh, all of these things were part of the um, theater that took place on the backs of these trucks. And this activity brought uh, Valdez worldwide fame and uh, he now has almost legendary status in the theater world as a result of this activity back in the 1960s. However, once the farm workers achieved their union and the labor strife dissipated in the um, early, mid-1970s, Valdez moved in a new direction. He had established the headquarters of El Teatro Campesino in Hollister, California, and that Hollister remains the headquarters for El Teatro Campesino. But the theater company seldom goes out to the communities it once uh, provided performances for and people from around the world make the pilgrimage to Hollister uh, to see the theatrical activities taking place there. Uh, I remember back in the late 70s I saw El Teatro Campesino, they, they came to the uh, Theater Arts Department here at San Jose State and performed in the University Theater. It was a completely different experience than uh, normally takes place in the theater uh, in a different kind of audience altogether. They came from largely Spanish-speaking um, communities in San Jose and uh, they wandered in and out during the performance. Scenes were repeated in case you missed it. Uh, and it was kind of like a review show uh, with songs and, and dances and with interspersed with these sketches such as I've already described and um, uh, it was clear that this the kind of theater he had created and still creates um, in, in Hollister uh, had a very specific audience in mind. It's a Chicano audience uh, that has a very shared sense of experience about the world and comes out of the, the, the farm worker uh, culture. Um, myself sitting in the audience uh, felt like a visitor to another culture altogether and uh, it was, it was uh, uh, very interesting indeed uh, and something that doesn't happen very often in the university theater. But in any case, Valdez uh, moved away from the kind of hardcore political activism of his earlier days and uh, uh, built a different kind of theater uh, uh, culture at um, uh, in Hollister with El Teatro Campesino. Most of the plays now, and for many decades preceding now, uh, incorporate myth mythological elements from Mexican history Aztec history and these images and you know, rites and um, stories 
resonate in the minds of those who have migrated from Mexico. Uh, and so they have a kind of, the, the, the theater works as a way of, of restoring to consciousness this sense of heritage that, that dates back to times before white people uh, come to um, Mexico or North America. His experience in Hollywood, um, making the uh, very popular movie La Bamba about Richie Valens, a pop singer in the 1950s who uh, uh, achieved nationwide popularity um, before his sudden death in an airplane crash. He came from a Chicano background, and uh, Valdez uh, made a very good movie about that. Um, Ch young Ch uh, Chicano men uh, at that time favored these double-breasted, uh, padded shoulder suits called zoot suits. And uh, in 1943, they had gathered. Uh, as they did on a Saturday night in uh, Los Angeles. And the police had uh, suspected them of gang activity and, and um, leaned hard on them and they fought back. And a big riot ensued, uh, quite shock uh, to Los Angeles at that time. And uh, the event resonates very strongly in the, the Chicano minds. As a, it's a transformative well, Chicano culture as a whole, you might say, decided they had had enough and they would stand up uh, to the, uh, the white culture that seemed to be, that was oppressing them. And um, uh, from that moment on, this growing sense of, of defiance has been, you might say, a part of the the Chicano culture and allowed for the development of the, of the farm workers movement uh, as the necessary uh, assertion of, of cultural identity and refusal to back down. So it had a great deal of success in Los Angeles, but it didn't do so well in New York when uh, Luis Valdez brought it there. Hispanic audiences didn't show up, even though New York has a huge Hispanic audience. But it's cl it was clear from the Zoot Suit uh, production that Hispanic cultures uh, did not have any kind of unifying experience, sense of, um, of belonging to each other, uh, and um, a play about the Chicano experience wasn't necessarily going to resonate with Hispanics who were outside of that Chicano experience any more than, say, whites or Asian culture would be expected to, even though in Los Angeles the audience for Zoot Suit was largely white uh, uh, rather than Hispanic, although Subsequent productions of Zoot Suits have, uh, has in, in California, but not elsewhere, have um, uh, attracted uh, strong Hispanic audiences. So Zoot Suit in the early 80s was evidence of a, um, of a kind of uh, fragmentation in the Hispanic uh, culture that meant different different um, sectors of the Hispanic culture entailed their own uh, way of representing themselves and differentiating themselves from other Hispanic sectors. Uh, so let me mention Maria Irene Fornes, who had, um, she's been very prolific since the 1960s uh, and um, uh, continues now, I guess in her 70s or 80s, to be uh, still a very busy playwright and theater director. And she has uh, consistently um, focused on 
themes of um, uh, female struggle for uh, freedom, for, for really oppressive or constraining circumstances in different milieu. She does not focus on her uh, heritage as a Cuban-American, nor does she um, necessarily write plays about Hispanic or clearly identified Hispanic uh, characters. Uh, she sometimes writes about Hispanic cultures in Central America or Latin America with which that are outside of her own heritage, or she will write plays about uh, women in circumstances where it's not clear that any of them are Hispanic. So she subordinates an interest in Hispanic cultures to a larger driving interest in the um, way in which women uh, act to release themselves from oppressive constraints on their um, capacity to desire and to um, uh, assert some kind of power over their um, lives or shape their own death. So you might say that for foreignness, mm -hmm. the uh, Hispanic culture is subordinate to a feminist goal um, and she uses the Hispanic culture at will. When she feels like it, she does so. It makes clear that she's um, uh, representing a, a Hispanic environment such as the conduct of life which I directed I don't know, 20 or so years ago um, set in some you know, Central American country um, uh, but the play really functions more as a critique of, of uh, Latino models of maleness and the way in which women interact with those models and um, overcome the constraints that they impose on, on their own identities. On the other hand, Eduardo Machado is a C Cuban uh, his heritage is Cuban-American, and his plays have tended to focus on the experience of, of immigrants from Cuba. Uh, and uh, in this respect, he has a very large project describing how different generations of Cuban-Americans responded to the times in which they lived. So he, he will follow he did a great trilogy on this subject and has pursued it set, uh, in other places as well. Uh, a generation of, um, of uh, upper class uh, Cubans before the revolution in 1959-1960. Then the generation that migrated to the United States after the revolution. And then the generation that grew up in the United States uh, sons and daughters of those who had migrated from Cuba and that's a big complex story involving the uh, evolution of entire families or family line uh, through many decades and uh, dramatizing the, the way in which historical pressures have shaped the identities of families and clarifying who they are. Are, are, they, are they Cubans or are they Americans? And for some, they retain this attachment to Cuba that uh, separates them from or prevents them fully integrating into the United States, whereas others have abandoned their Cuban identity and become American or embraced a kind of a, an American way of life that uh, puts them in tension with others within the family or
with their heritage. Uh, so that's a very uh, fascinating uh, exploration of family life across generations and historical epochs. And, and um, uh, Machado seldom moves outside of this focus on the Cuban-American experience, and yet his plays resonate well beyond uh, uh, Cuban-American audiences. Uh, he seems to attract audiences in Europe and um, uh, South America, as well as Asia, with, with plays about this Cuban-American familial experience. Uh, in, in, in the plays have a power to um, sustain you know, grip audiences who you might think don't see themselves in the plays. But I think what's really interesting to audiences on a global level is how he is able to show the way in which families evolve in relation to historical circumstances. And that's what's really engaging to uh, audiences worldwide. It doesn't depend on a specific American experience to establish its importance. John Leguizamo's Puerto Rican, he's taken a different approach insofar as Puerto Rican uh, culture has not been as widely or powerfully represented uh, in the theater as you might expect, uh, considering how large the Puerto Rican population in New York is. But his work is largely autobiographical. He does stand-up, uh, solo performance, and shares with audiences uh, experiences from his life, often <laughs> quite raunchy and, and consistently very, very funny. And he does all of these impersonations of, of people in his past or his life uh, that uh, um, gives voice to all of these uh, uh, figures of Puerto Rican culture in which he grew up. And uh, sometimes creates a controversy because he doesn't always provide a very flattering por uh, portrayal of, of the Puerto Rican experience. He's had a great deal of success in Hollywood, often playing drug dealers and gangsters in movies about uh, the New York City drug trade, criminal crime movies. Um, and his autobiographical shows uh, are efforts to break free of the kind of stripping that Hollywood had uh, sort of imposed upon his really extraordinary performance skills. He, he's, just a very gifted actor uh, and um, capable of a wide range of expressions in his voice, facial expressions, and, and uh, bodily movements. And he employs this skill in to incarnate all of these figures, ever diverse, uh, from his Puerto Rican heritage, people in the neighborhood in which he grew up in, um, in Brooklyn, New York. By contrast, Milcha, Milcha Sanchez Scott, she was born in Indonesia. Her mother was Indonesian, her father was Colombian, and uh, she grew up in a kind of global way uh, in Indonesia, in Colombia, uh, in England, uh, where she had much of her education, and then she moved to New York. And um, she writes plays from the point of view of a person who, uh, in the perspective of a person whose identity is quite ambiguous. Uh, she writes uh, as if bringing a kind of spirit of anthropological inquiry to um, uh, the subject matter of her plays, which is often about um, Hispanic life in uh, Mexico, 
and uh, in the American Southwest. She writes plays that describe this sort of um, strange relation to mythology and to um, codes of conduct and, and um, um, uh, ways of interacting between men and women and animals in, uh, in the rural culture of, of Mexico and the Southwest. Uh, in, I guess we could say but, uh, uh, preoccupation. Uh, Milcha Sanchez Scott is uh, the way in which um, uh, male and female characters in this environment uh, understand their relation to to nature, to, to, to nature, to animal identity, mm -hmm. to, to uh, some kind of um, of uh, natural. Um, natural revelation of themselves or, or figures of, of nature or are they somehow um, shaped by some uh, civilizing power that they that they either that they resist and at the same time um, uh, submit to so it's, a, it's her identity itself has a kind of, um, of ambiguity to it she uh, tries to infuse her plays with the kind of uh, ambiguity of identity about the, the, the way in which the characters are, are the uh, outsiders or native or organic to the, to the environment in which they live. Uh, I think that's probably how you can you might sum up her themes, uh, but it's, it's definitely a different kind of Hispanic theater from the others that I've just mentioned.